Thank you for coming out on this, this wet day. It uh, is clearing up a little bit, but I appreciate your presence. I'm glad to be here. You know, I often talk about the fact that there's a time for each and every one of us when we come into this world, and there's a time for each and every one of us when our time will be up and we'll leave this world, and in between we have a line, a timeline, we call our lifetime. As we move into our teen years and adult years, we spend most of our time pursuing happiness. We all want to increase the quality of our lives. So we have dreams, we have desires, and we have goals that we want to push forward to manifest in our lives. We also spend a great deal of our time in a state of sadness or defeat because that which we want, we can't seem to get. So we feel like we're a failure. Now the reason that happens is because once we engage in something to move towards a goal, we oftentimes don't expect to be obstacles or things that are going to prevent us or hinder us from reaching that. And so with the slightest little problem, we say, oh, this just wasn't meant to be. I guess it's not my time or something. Now, I have this problem um, continually with my cousin Ozzy. He always has dreams and he has desires and he's reared up and enthusiastic and then he takes one step onto the path of manifesting those dreams. Something happens he didn't expect and he says, oh, it wasn't for me. Oh, it just isn't going to work out. And I become frustrated with him. I say, Ozzy, if you have a dream, you keep your focus on it. You keep moving towards it. Don't give up. Don't back off. Keep moving towards whatever it is you want. And if you don't actually achieve that, you're going to achieve something that is much better. Now, one of the issues he was dealing with was the Moose Club, or the Moose Lodge in Dundas, South Dakota, where he lives, was planning a big trip down to Bloxy, Mississippi for a Midwest conference of the, the moose, moose people, or whatever you, <laughs> whatever you call them. And he was excited about it because Bloxy has some fabulous golf courses, and he wanted to go down there to play golf. But then as the time drew near, he started coming up with excuses. Oh, well, the money thing. I just really can't afford it at this time. Or the timing isn't right. I really should be doing this. One excuse after another why he wasn't going to pursue this dream. And I said, Ozzy, stop that. I want you to focus on going to Biloxi. I want you to focus on being in the golf course. I want you to focus on playing 18 holes. No matter what, that's what's going to happen, and you're going to have a great time. So with that bit of advice, he took off and went to Bloxy. Shortly after he got back, I called him up and says, hey, how did it go, Ozzy? He says, it was literally a drag. And I said, why? What happened? He says, well, is everything good? And the very first day, we got out in the golf course. Beautiful day. But on the third hole, my golfing partner, Lars Ivinson, passed out fell to the ground, and he seemed to be in a coma. No matter what I did, I couldn't seem to awaken him. So the rest of the day was hitting the golf ball, dragging Lars. <laughs> hitting the golf ball and dragging Lars. <clears throat> uh, any golfers in here? <laughs> yeah. Well, you can appreciate that. Anyway, some, uh, um, I'm not, I'm, um, new chapter. <laughs> One of the reasons why we don't actually accomplish the life that we want to live is because, as I said before, we have too many obstacles in our way. And even though we have the power to overcome those obstacles and to move forward and achieve whatever it is we want to achieve, we don't think that we do. We forget that we have been blessed with spiritual attributes which help us negotiate our life. Wonderful attributes like love, like strength, like imagination, like uh, persistence and perseverance. But the strongest power that we have of all is the power of the expressed word. Well, let's just think about that for a minute. How important words are. We take them for granted, but words are everything. Words can hurt, words can heal. Words can be a, a, a motivating factor that moves us forward, or they can be a defeating factor that moves us back. 
Words are everything, especially when it comes to developing relationships. The greatest hurt we can put on somebody is through our words, in an emotional sense. The greatest hurt we can put on somebody is to say something to them that diminishes their self-worth or what they think their worth is to be. Something that, that, that attacks the person and makes them feel like they're less than they should be, like somebody else is better than them, and that hurts. We've all been through it from time to time, whether it's been in a, a friendship argument or with somebody out in the street. Something is said to us, and even though we protect ourselves and we try to be good, true students, sometimes that just hurts when somebody says something to us that makes us feel we're less than we should be. The secret to having a life that is fulfilling and is purposeful and rewarding is to first of all determine what it is we value in life. What is it? Well, many things we value. We value friendships. We value uh, the, the uh, amenities that we have in this life. But above and beyond everything else, each and every one of us in this room values peace more than anything. Peace of mind. We can deal with upsets. We can deal with failures. We can deal with setbacks. We can deal with, with conflicts. We can deal with whatever the world brings to us if we have peace of mind if we can just maintain peace of mind and not be distracted or not be drawn into some sort of a, a, a mental state that has us angry or, or feeling like a failure. Peace of mind is everything. Now, we've done a great job over the, uh, the last hundred years of developing uh, technological and scientific and, and medical advancements. We live in a world where we take for commonplace things that would have been a an absolute miracle or an impossibility a hundred years ago. When I was born, there was no television, there was no cell phone, there was no um, internet, no computers. All of that has happened in my lifetime, and yours most likely. And for a child born today, they say for all practical purposes, that child will live to be 140 years old. Now think about that. A child born today will live to be 140 years old and will have a healthy body and physical condition, 140 years old. They say for a child born today, that person's children will be able to custom design their children. They'll be able to manipulate the, uh, the DNA system and determine how tall in, in the, the um, uh, skin color and the intellectual level, all of these things. It's like we're playing God and getting to a point where we can create the world around us exactly the way we want. But in the midst of all that, in the midst of all those advancements, we aren't paying attention to and we aren't putting our efforts into evolving spiritually. The state that we live in right now, in this culture and around the world, isn't one that we would get a good grade on if they gave us a report card. I mean, we are still fighting with people on the other side of the world. <clears throat> We're setting examples for the young children growing up, horrible examples of what type of, of uh, mannerisms are okay in this world. We have people who are supposed to be admired, who are in high positions, who are, who are governing uh, other people calling people names publicly and saying things that are very hurtful, even things beyond the person calling their family different names and, and making all sorts of accusations about it. So what I'm trying to say is that we have to somehow say thank you God for everything, but now let me work on myself and let me take what I value and put my attention forth to increase that. If our value is peace of mind, which it all should be, then how can we increase that in our lives? And the best way we can increase that in our lives is through our words. Our words are the most hurtful things we put into the world, whether it be a bullet or an arrow or whatever. Words are those things that hurt and that sting. So we have to come to a point where we put peace as a priority before the express word that has the ability to hurt. Now, in the book of Matthew, Jesus is a young minister, fresh out of the gate. 
His very first sermon is the Sermon of the Mount. And he calls all the people together and he goes up on the mountain, all of his disciples, and he knows the first thing that they have to do is to instill within them a sense of peace because they're going to get resistance when they go out into the world. They're going to get attacked. They're going to have people that don't like them. They're going to have people that will throw stones at them. So he impressed upon them peace as the first priority. And he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. When I was a seventh grader at the Lutheran confirmation class, and the minister went to talk about that, you know, I nudged the, the guy next to me, and he nudged me back. I said, yeah, what's he talking about? The meek shall inherit the earth? You know, a seventh grade boy playing football and getting in fights in the back alley doesn't want to hear that because the meek, the, the, the passive, the, the cowardly, were not, frown, or not looked upon as being anybody that was, um, that was worthy of attention. The meek shall inherit the earth. Now, I carry that with me for all these years, and recently I've been reading a book by Jordan Peterson called The Twelve Rules of Life. And when he ran across that, he had the same trouble with that verse that I did. And so he did the research on it, and he discovered that meek came from a Greek word that translated back into Greek doesn't mean uh, passive or cowardly or, or afraid, but rather it means one who is emboldened and one who is powerful, and, and it referred to a, a warrior, and one who has a sword and he's an excellent swordsmanship. But he never draws his sword. It's one who's got the power but doesn't use it. That is the people that are going to inherit the earth. Now, we're not on the battlefield, we're not involved in sword fights, but we are involved with a number of battles with words. Somebody says something, we uh, respond or react in a, in a negative way, and pretty soon a conflict begins, and things are said that hurt both ourselves and the other people. To be meek means to be confident, to stand your ground, to believe what you believe in, but to not use that to disrupt the peace in your world, to hold that back and use your words to create peace and not destroy it. Now, each and every one of us, as we grew up, we lived in a world, a family, a culture, a school that imposed on us or impressed upon us certain conditions on how to be. And many of us that were raised in an age where the soldiers were coming back from war, we were taught to be soldiers. We were taught to be strong, to be big, and big boys never cry, and, and all of this stuff. So we're raised with this conditioning, and we get to a point when we enter our early adult years where pretty much everything, every reaction that we have to whatever goes on in the world is set, and it happens just like that. We don't even think about it. Somebody cuts me off in traffic. Oh, this isn't now. This is a while back. I've improved, let me tell you. <laughs> but somebody cuts you off in traffic without even thinking, immediately the hand goes to the horn. We get angry. If we cut somebody off in traffic and somebody's hand goes to the horn, we get angry. It's like, what are you talking about? Me, I didn't do anything. God, give me a break. What's going on here? So we have these, this conditioning that, that describes how we react to the world. And isn't that really what we do? Aren't we always reacting to something in the world? Isn't that all life's all about? I mean, every action, every reaction we have is responding to or reacting to something in the world around us. We take stuff in, we have a perception of what's going on, and then we react to it. Now, once again, our reactions are very limited. They're immediate. They're a split second. So what we have to do is to develop our spiritual talent of response. And a response is a mature reaction. A response is, a response is something that we put some thought into and we're, we're aware of the fact that peace is the priority and we're going to respond accordingly. Now in the front of your bulletin, I've just made a very rough diagram there that shows how that works. What a reaction is, it's immediate. A response is stretched out where we have time to regain our composure, we have time to think about, do I really want to do this or do I really want to say this? And then respond in a way that brings a sense of peace, not only to us, but a sense of peace to the world around us. 
Life is an incredible experience. We have problems, we have challenges, we have ups and downs, but we can manage everything that comes to us, not in a state of high anger, not in a state of hysterics, not in a state of anxiety or worry, but in a state of peace, a peaceful mind, a peaceful heart, and a peaceful spirit. Well, let's think about that as we go into meditation. The priority always has to be peace when I move into meditation. Peace.